thank uh, Professor Mukija for that very kind introduction and for inviting me here. This is, uh, for me, like a vacation to get out of the office and come engage with some great thought people. Uh, sometimes people ask me, how did you get interested in street vending anyway? And uh, it all started about 20 years ago when I moved to Southern California. I grew up in the suburban west, never seen a street vendor before, and uh, saw this scene in L.A. and you know, all over town where people were selling oranges on freeway ramps, selling whatever you wanted to buy on sidewalks, and particularly the MacArthur Park area of town. And uh, I found this interesting, just visually, just interesting. And then I found out that this is illegal in Los Angeles. It's illegal to sell anything from the sidewalk. It has been illegal in Los Angeles for at least 80 years. Um, and then I got really interested in this sector. And so uh, I was a young lawyer at the time practicing law, and I resolved if I ever had the opportunity to write, I was going to write about this. And so when I became an academic, I said, well, there's now my chance. I'm going to write about street vending. And so I, I, per- I approached street vending from a policy, a legal policy perspective, um, sympathetic to the practice of street vending, but understanding that there are two sides to every issue. Um, felt an itch after a while in academia and found a job at the mayor's office. And my interest in street vending has continued, but now it's leavened with um, the recognition that to affect policy change, you got to make it happen politically. And, and that's not always an easy thing. So uh, I do a little bit of policy work on street vending up the city through my involvement with food policy. And so I try to bring an academic perspective to my work. Okay, so um, let me give you an overview of, of what I'm going to be sharing with you today. Uh, I'm first going to address some theories of informality. I understand the speaker series is all about informality. So I've come up with a couple of theories of informality uh, based on some theories that are already in the literature. Uh, and then I'm going to test these theories of informality against some data. I was lucky enough to get a set of uh, street vending enforcement data from the city of New York. New York has a very robust uh, street vending economy. It's legal, but heavily regulated. And uh, I have access to 53,000 individual citations for street vending enforcement in New York. So I'm going to test these theories of informality against the data from New York. Um, I'm going to share some lessons that I drew from looking at this data, this analysis. Uh, I'm going to talk about some my own views about what are the prospects for policy change in the city of Los Angeles when it comes to street vending, and then I'll open up to questions and answers. So let's talk about informality. I I read a a fair amount of the literature uh, in this area on informality, and I'm interested in figuring out what does informality mean? What do people mean when they say it's an informal informal economy or it's an informality? And I see two strands in the literature. One strand I'm going to call law avoidance. And by law avoiding, it refers to these activities that are not in themselves illegal, but structured in a way to get around the law, get around certain regulations or restrictions that would otherwise apply. And so street vending actually fits well into this model of law avoiding. Because imagine you're an entrepreneur, you have a cart or some sort of a truck vehicle. You want to have other people run the cart on the street selling goods. You don't want to do it yourself. You could hire these people as employees, in which case you'd have to pay for workers' compensation insurance, you'd have to take care of their payroll taxes, you'd have to do a lot of stuff, you'd have to provide a safe work environment. But if you hire these street vendors as independent contractors, all that would be on them. They get injured on the job, that's their problem. They have some tax issues, that's their problem, it's not yours. So street vending is one example of a number of businesses that find it easier or attractive to hire people as independent contractors as opposed to employees to avoid laws that otherwise apply. So informality is law avoiding. That's one strand I see in the A second strand I see is informality is law evading. These are activities that are either breaking the law or find it tempting, easy to break the law. And again, street vending fits well within this. Typically, the transactions in street vending are are small, cash-based. Not a lot of investment in these street vending enterprises. So if you get busted by the cops, if you see a cop coming, leave your stuff on the sidewalk, leave your cart, leave the shopping cart, and run. You're not out much. 
cash transactions, you're not going to have much to report at tax time if you choose not to report everything you've done. So street vending is another, fits well under this theory of informalities of the law today. But we've talked a lot about law in both of these definitions of informality. Law is an integral part of both of these definitions. And as a lawyer, I raise men and say, wait a minute, folks, what kind of law are you talking about? In other words, does the kind of law at issue matter when something becomes informal, when some activity is labeled informal activity? And so as a lawyer, I can think of a bunch of different ways to categorize laws. You can slice them and dice them in a host of different ways. So one way to think about a particular law is to say, well, how is this law structured? How is the law structured? And one way you can identify a law by a structure is to ask whether it's a crystal law or a mud law. And I choose these terms, crystals and mud, because they're metaphors that I hope will capture what different kinds of laws do. Here's an example of a crystal law. No general vendor shall vend within 10 feet of any driveway, any subway entrance or exit, or any point. This is copied from the New York Rules on Street Vending. Now, I call this a crystal rule because it's pretty easy to figure out what it means. Do you think we're going to have much dispute over whether someone's breaking the law or not? No. If you have a tape measure, if we come out with a tape measure to use, there's not going to be much dispute as to whether this law has been violated or not. It's so clear, it's almost crystal clear. It's an objective rule, easy to apply. And this is a big advantage of crystal rules. They're easy to apply. We don't need to call a cop. We don't need to go to court. We can resolve this right now, here and now. So some laws are crystal. Other laws are mud at the other extreme. Here's another example taken from New York City's Rules on Street Vending. A vending cart's umbrella shall be safely secured, safely secured, what does that mean, to the cart and maintained in good condition. Maintained in good condition, what does that mean, in repair. And so I look at this rule. If I'm a vendor, I'm wondering, well, gosh, I have this vending cart umbrella. I bought it a few years ago. It's kind of faded now. Some of the times it broke. It works OK. OK, it's rusty, but no big deal. And a cop comes along and sort of eyeballs me and says, you know, this is a Tony neighborhood. I don't know. I don't like the looks of your umbrella. I don't think you're keeping it in good enough repair. And so the cop writes me a ticket. And so I protest. And I say, what do you mean? It's good enough for me. I don't get it. And so I might have a conversation with the cop. And if I choose to fight the citation in court, I'm going to have a conversation with the judge. Your Honor, look, I got pictures. Like with Judge Judy. I got pictures of my cart. Look at those. They're beautiful. And the judge will say, eh, I don't know. So mud rules, you see the disadvantage to mud rules, is that they are difficult to apply in specific situations. Marginal situations. That's the extremes we can agree on, sure. But in the middle, there's this gray area. It's not clear whether I'm in violation or not. It's mud. And that's why these rules have been called mud rules by some of the extremists. OK, so that sets out the structure of the rules. One way to look at the rules, laws, is look at the structure and say, is it a mud law or is it a crystal law? Another way you can slice and dice laws is to look at their subject. What is the subject of a particular rule? And for purposes of street vending, I've drawn a distinction between spatial rules and non-spatial rules. So I'm going to go back to the New York codes again. Here's a spatial rule on street vending in New York City. No general vendor shall vend on the median strip of a divided roadway unless such strip is intended for use as a pedestrian mall or plaza. So clearly this rule, the subject is focusing on the where. It's not about who. It's not about how. It's not about when. It's only focused on the where of that activity. So it makes it a spatial rule. Then, of course, there are lots of non-spatial rules in New York City. The use or keeping of utensils and containers which are chipped, cracked, rusted, corroded, or badly worn, or in such condition that they cannot be easily made or cleaned and sanitary is prohibited. A non-spatial rule. And also, by the way, I'll ask you, what do you think? Is this crystal or mud? Mud. I would agree. This is not a mud rule. So you see how you can slice up and categorize any law in a number of ways. Is it crystal or mud? Is it spatial or non-spatial? So that's my approach as far as the law is concerned. Now, I want to come back to crystals and mud just for a second and extend the analysis a little bit more. If informality is being driven by crystal laws, 
I submit that we should be thinking of informality as an impossible. Informality as impossible. And here's why. You've got thousands of street vendors in New York City. If they're getting cited repeatedly for violating crystal rules, <coughs> it's not that they don't know what the law is, they can't figure it out. They know what the law is, or they should, and they're violating it anyway. Right. That's a sign that there's something wrong with the law, that the law is making it impossible for people to comply. So to the extent that street vending is an example of informality, and if informality is being driven by these crystal rules, that means we have the theory of informality as impossibility. Crystals are driving this. Informality is about impossibility. Now, on the other hand, if the vendors in New York are getting cited for violating mud rules, the cops are walking down the street, eh, I don't like the look of your umbrella. I'm going to cite you. If it's all about mud rules, then it suggests that informality is about confusion. That nobody really knows what the rules are. I'm a vendor I'm out there. I don't know if I'm going to get busted today or not. Maybe it depends on the mood of the cop. Maybe the mood of the judge. If I get a citation, I'm going to challenge it. I don't know. I'm confused. So I'm going to call this, this concept, if it's being driven by mud rules, this is informality as confusion. Okay, let, let's turn to the data. So I, I laid out the theory for you. Now I'm going to test the data. So I already mentioned I got a lot of street vending enforcement data from New York. Let me give you some context. New York City, thousands of vendors. One recent estimate says there are over 12,000 vendors working in New York City. Quite a few. Diverse rules. A code very thick, not, not literally this thick, but metaphorically this thick, of rules on street vending in New York City. Not only do we have a lot of rules, we have rules very common. We have crystal rules, we have mud rules. We have spatial rules, and we have non-spatial rules. And they all are, to some extent or another, enforced. So we've got some good data to work with in New York City. And finally, we have this thing called the Street Vendor Project. This is a nonprofit organization in New York that cares a lot about vendors, advocates on their behalf, goes to court on their behalf, advocates for legislative change. This nonprofit organization then has its ears on the ground. This organization knows what's going on, and they care a lot about this issue, so they can, they're in a position to help other folks understand the facts. So, we collected some data. The Street Vendor Project in New York made a Freedom of Information Act request, Public Records Act request, to the City of New York. Give us all your citations that you've given to vendors in the years 2009 and 2010. And New York City, bless their heart, they complied, and they had to under the law. And they gave us 53,000 <coughs> individual citations. 53,000 street vendor citations in two years for 12,000 vendors. Thank you. Okay. Now, fortunately, New York City was kind to us. They didn't give us boxes of paper citations to sit through. They gave to us an electronic format, which from a scholarly perspective, or from all of our perspective, this is great. Because that means we can manipulate the data with relative ease using an Excel spreadsheet and other electronic programs. And I also relied on some help from some good friends to do this project. Sean Brzezinski, he's the director of the Street Vendor Project. He's the I got this information and said, Kettles, you want it? You can have it. Thank you, Sean. Thank you also to Alfonso Morales. He's an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin. He follows street vending issues closely. He's approaching from the urban planning side. Smart guy, helped get some resources to this issue, helped me bounce ideas off back and forth about how to approach this issue. Thank you to Alfonso. And finally, Brittany Schwecko, a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin who did the preliminary number crunch. She's going to ram the, the, the numbers through some models to see what uh, see what answers. Okay, so what are the results? We crunched the number, we took these 53,000 street vending citations, ran some analyses on them, and what did we find? On the questions of on the question of crystals versus mud, the answer is it's mostly crystal. In other words, street vending informality in New York City is primarily about impossibility rather than confusion. 75% of the citations given to the street vendors over this two-year period were for crystal rules, violating crystal rules. 
you thou shalt not be closer than eight feet from an intersection, no more than ten feet from a doorway, no more than five feet from a bus stop, no more than three feet from a subway entrance, and so on. All these crystal rules, that's what the vendors in New York City are primarily getting cited for. What happens when they go to court? Anything change? No. In fact, the crystal predominance gets reinforced. You get your citation on the street, you say, I'm going to fight this thing, I'm going to go to court. So you go to court, and the judge says, eight feet from the intersection. It sounds like a violation to me, what do you have to say for yourself? It's not true, it's not true, Your Honor. No, I'm sorry, I believe the cop. I believe the cop got with it. The crystal citations are, in other words, less likely to be dismissed. The judges, when they see the crystal citation, are much apt to uphold the cop, take the cop side of the story, and not believe the vendor side of the story. The mud rules, to the extent they get written out, those are more likely to get thrown out. So if you get cited for a dirty umbrella, the judge is going to say, really? Really, officer? A dirty umbrella? What happens when, when it comes time to pay the citation? Do crystal rules get paid more, or do mud rules get paid more? The answer is it doesn't matter. Vendors are equally likely, or as the case is unlikely, uh, to pay a citation regardless of whether it is crystal or mud. So, big picture conclusion in here is that crystal rules are, are driving informality, street vending informality in New York City. In other words, it's all about impossibility, not so much about it. What about the spatial question that comes? Are street, is street vending enforcement in New York City, is street vending informality primarily about uh, enforcement of spatial rules, or is it about the non-spatial rules? Spatial. Spatial is what's driving. 75% of the citations are for administrative not help. Now, why do I put down your administrative as goes to office? The New York codes that apply to street vendors are come in two different places. There are a set of administrative rules and a set of health rules. The administrative rules, to the extent they're enforced, by and large are spatial. They, are, they tell you where you can set up in New York City, not in, in Midtown, in this big block, block around Midtown, not in a big block around downtown, certain streets. Avenue of the Americas has different restrictions depending on which segment of Avenue the Americas you are and so on. How close you can be to an intersection, how close you can be to a fire hydrant, and other things. All these locational restrictions are in the administrative code. Seventy-five percent of the citations are for violating these administrative rules to say spatial restrictions. The health code goes to how you're conducting your business. Is your hair secure? Are your utensils clean? Is your cart clean? Is the food kept at a proper temperature? Those are all the health rules. They go to more how you're doing your business. Only 25% of the citations are for violating the health rules. Now, the spatial emphasis is diminished a little bit when we consider what happens in court and what fines get paid. Health violations are less likely to be dismissed. <coughs> so if you get a health citation as a street vendor in New York, it's much more likely that citation is going to stick. When you go to court, the judge is more likely to say, eh, we're going to uphold this one. That's pretty serious. You can't enter the utensils anymore. Health is also more likely to be paid. When the vendor gets a citation for violating health, they're much more likely to pay that citation, or twice as likely as they are to pay um, a spatial violation citation. So, street vending informality is primarily spatially driven, but quite as strongly as it was in the crystals versus mud context. It's primarily spatial, but not, not overwhelmingly spatial. It's also not Okay, so what lessons do I draw, draw from this? As a policymaker, as someone in a position to influence policy and advocate for change, and you folks who are in a position too, what lessons can we draw from this? Lesson number one is that the police and the courts may be trusted with mud rules. Now, this may not seem like such a big deal to you, but to the civil rights lawyer and community, this is important. For a long, long time, literally centuries, public order in our country and in Western Europe was driven by mud rules. Rules against loitering, rules against nuisance, 
And these rules gave police a lot of discretion to make unwanted people move along. So the lawyering rules, for example, in American cities would say things like, uh, you may not be on uh, a public sidewalk with no lawful purpose. No lawful purpose? What on earth does that mean? Could you think of a muddier rule than that? This law was on the books in cities, and the police used this to keep order, to keep peace. Now, as you can imagine, these kinds of mud rules, loitering rules in particular, got a bad rap during the civil rights movement. Because <coughs> cops would use these rules to violate the civil rights of African Americans and others. And so mud, rule, mud rules fall into disrepute. And I think cities started to focus more on getting crystal rules to uh, maintain order in the streets. Since the civil rights movement, Policing practices have changed. The face of police departments all over the country changed. LAPD is a prime example. New York and New York is another example. And the data in New York gives me hope that police departments have changed. The identity of the judges have changed too. So they're no longer upholding citations for money. Even loitering, how to do it. Cops aren't doing that. Judges aren't doing that anymore. At least that's what this data in New York City suggests. It suggests maybe we should take another look at more rules. Maybe we can trust the cops in the course of the summer to do the right thing for these matters. So that's lesson one. Lesson two, beware of crystal rules that are too restrictive. I already talked about the great advantage of crystal rules. Wow, they're so easy to apply. We don't need to go to court. We can work this out right here. Well, there's a problem that the crystal rules are so restrictive, they can't work. There's nowhere to bend. That's not a good thing. So before we start jumping up and down in favor of crystal rules, be careful. Don't stack them too many on top of each other so that there's no need to have any activities. And then uh, a final lesson. Reconsider whether too little space is allowed for them. The data showed that more citations were given for spatial violations than for health code, for non-spatial violations. Think about it. That's a sign, I think, that New York is too restrictive on uh, where they allow vending to occur. And for other jurisdictions that are thinking about vending, you should think about it. Here in LA, if we're going to legalize vending, we need to think about how much space they're going to get. We should have a fair amount of space for them. This is going to be real. We, we should be aware of using too many crystal rules. And of course, I think we should be looking at that rules. Because I think we ought to give, give the cops and the courts a chance to, uh, to do right now. Okay, so, so those are my lessons. Big picture. Now, what about politics? What about LA? I told you at the, at the beginning of my presentation, it's illegal to bend in Los Angeles. We don't have this great, robust legal bending scene in LA like they do in New York and many other cities, things like Chicago or Portland. Instead, it's all illegal. So, what are the prospects for changing the law? What are the prospects of legalizing bending in Los Angeles? Realistically, I see some serious challenges to legalizing that in The first challenge is this law called the California Retail Food Code. This is a state law that regulates how people can prepare food that is sold to the consumer. So every restaurant in the state of California is subject to this food code. And this food code is based on a model code that is published by the Food and Drug Administration in Washington, D.C., published every five years. And the FDA has been publishing this thing since about the 1930s. Every five years, they publish a new one. And you know, big surprise, it's only going in one direction. Every year, or every five years, a new one comes out. It's a little bit more restrictive than that. The goal of this food code is to prevent people from getting sick. It's to prevent people from catching food poisoning at a restaurant. But the problem is that it's so expensive to comply with the retail food code, you've got to have a kitchen that looks like this if you want to make food and sell it to the public. My kitchen doesn't look like that. Okay? I, I can't bake my cookies at home and go sell them on the street to consumers. That's a violation of the retail food code. And so for a street vendor, you think about a street vendor, you got a cart, push it on the sidewalk, where's the kitchen? You know, maybe they have a little butane burner or something if they're trying to cook on the street. Maybe they have a, a grill on the street. They don't have this on the street. So how is their car connected to this thing? Because if their car is not somehow connected to some place that looks like this, we got a problem. 
The city of LA could legalize vending all over town if it wanted to. But the health department's going to say, whoa, 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 at least with respect to food vendors, where is this food prepared? Have you been trained in a kitchen like this? Do you have a kitchen like this? So we have a problem. We're a problem at least when it comes to food. Another problem. City of LA is broke. If you haven't heard already here from me, we're broke. And we're looking for ways to raise money. We're looking for ways to save money. And one of the ways the city is looking to make money is to say, what services do we provide for free that we could charge for? And so historically, farmers markets, like the Hollywood farmers market, a lot of it, great farmers market, close down some streets in Hollywood once a week, have a great farmers market, close down a lot of food traffic, a lot of it, it's fine. Well, it used to be we did that for free. And then we said, wait a minute, we have fire department people going out there to make sure everything's safe. We've got police department. We've got department of transportation people blocking traffic, putting up signs. That's costing us money. It's costing us time. We need to start charging. And so a couple years ago, the city passed a new ordinance saying, basically, you're using the public right of way. We're going to charge you. Or if we don't charge you, you're going to have to go through a process and talk to your city council person about to get away. So when you're talking about, let's legalize vending in LA, Whoa, whoa, whoa. Here's the sidewalk. The city is looking at this as a resource that could generate some cash, potential. So you've got to figure out, okay, how are we going to get around this? How are we going to make street vending inexpensive for the city of LA? Because if it costs the city a lot of money, they're going to pass that cost on to the vendors. And the vendors are going to say, 500 bucks for a permit? No, thanks. I'll, I'll just stay late and take it. Either way. Another challenge to street vending <coughs> changing the policy in Los Angeles is people who feel threatened by street cars. Here's a picture of a taco truck in front of a restaurant. Some restaurants don't like taco trucks. Some restaurants, rather than see them as an opportunity, as this restaurant did, because the restaurant owns the truck that's parked out in front of it. Some restaurants perceive Dr. Trucks to be a threat. They perceive them to be unfair competition. And so uh, a few years ago, um, restaurateurs in the county, particularly in East Los Angeles, went to the county board of supervisors and said, help us. You need to start enforcing the laws that make tr trucks have to move frequently. They want you to tighten up on those restrictions. They want you to make life hard for the trucks. And so they did. Um, City of Los Angeles, something similar happened. Now, not without a challenge, we're fortunate to have uh, Ingrid Eakley here from the law school at UCLA. Ingrid led, led the effort here in the city to overturn the city's restrictions on taco trucks that made them move frequently. And it was successful in that endeavor. Uh, but that, that effort by the restaurateurs is just the tip of the iceberg. Lots of people out there don't like trucks. Business owners, brick and mortar business owners, many of them don't see the upside. They don't see this as an opportunity. They feel threatened, particularly in this down economy. And so if you're trying to get street vending legalized in Los Angeles, that's an issue you're going to have to wrestle with. You're going to have to figure out, now, how do we frame this so they see that it's a win for them if there are more people on the street? Okay, so, so those are three big challenges I see in legalizing street vending. But... There are also opportunities. I see some openings in Los Angeles that I didn't see um, 15 or 20 years ago. One opportunity. This is an ad for cottage food law for California. What on earth is cottage food law? Cottage food law is a movement to say, by golly, kettles should be able to cook, bake cookies in his kitchen and sell them on the street or to a local restaurant. He ought to be able to do that. By God, which is wrong that he needs, that he needs a commercial budget. So there is this movement afoot nationally to carve out an exception in the retail food code to let people cook at home. Now, in a lot of places, it's let them cook safe stuff, like cookies and other baked things. They do some candy. Not posole, not tamales, but, you know, there's some products. Many states have gotten on the bandwagon. And there's a movement here in California to come up with a cottage food law. 
this cottage foodball effort is part of a greater movement around food. Past five years or so, food has just exploded as an issue. And it's exploded as an issue because people care more about their food, and people are starting to look at food as an intimate thing. The act of eating has become something intimate. That is to say, you want to know who you're eating with, and you want to know where your food came from. And people become less trustful of getting their food from strangers. I want to go to the farmer's market. I want to meet the farmer and grow these vegetables. I want to meet the farmer that harvested these eggs. I want to grow vegetables in my own backyard. There's this whole movement of food <coughs> to make food more intimate. This is a part of it. And I think street vending could plug into this movement. Not only to take advantage of these cottage food laws, but to take advantage of this, this movement towards making food intimate. I want to get to know the person I'm buying my food. I want to connect with them on the street. So I see that as an upside, a way to maybe we can get some, some energy from this movement. A, a second change I, I've seen recently is how people look at public space. How do we in Los Angeles look at the street and the sidewalk? Now, 120 years ago, the street and the sidewalk was all about, not all about, but a lot about recreation. It wasn't just about getting somewhere, it was about hanging out, playing games on the sidewalk. It was about listening to the Hurdy Gurdy Man play a song. It was about getting your shoes shined, making money on the sidewalk in the public space, in the case of the general man's needs. It was also about buying food, the stationary cart. And so a street about 120 years ago in New York City looks something like this. No one is driving 50 miles an hour down this street. If you're using the street for circulation, you're taking your time, and you're making sure you're not going to hit anyone. The street is also about buying and selling. It's about meeting your neighbor. It's about recreation. That's what it was like around the turn of the last century. But then something happened. God gave us the automobile. And suddenly a lot of the commerce that used to appear on the street and on the sidewalk went indoors. And the street, especially the roadbed, became a place of circulation. We got this automobile. I don't want anything in my way. I want unobstructed path. And it's around this time that Los Angeles started to get more and more restricted with respect to street vending. Before the automobile, vending was tolerated in LA. When the automobile came, uh, 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 out of the way. Sidewalks, too. People were using the sidewalks to get places. I don't want to be tripping over a shoeshine guy. I don't want kids playing on the sidewalk. Get out of my way. I'm going to go somewhere. There's a store down there that I need to get to. And so street vending was pushed off the street. Today's different, though. The past five or ten years, the, the Twitter truck scene or the gourmet truck scene, whatever you want to call it, has just exploded. And it's not just LA, it's all over the country. This is cool. People love these trucks. And these trucks are not parked so the driver can go inside a storefront and buy something. These trucks are parked at that meter all day long. They were overstaying their welcome. They're getting traffic tickets and they couldn't care less. Maybe. Because they're making money hand over fist, selling fun food that people want to hang out on the sidewalk, have a fun meal, meet some strangers, walk around, <laughs> go to this truck. It's fun. <laughs> this is big. So people are rediscovering streets, not as places of circulation after services storefronts, but rather places of fun and adventure, often around food. And here's a farmer's market. I think this is in, in San Rafael. You can barely make out the yellow striped line at the bottom of the page. This is on the street. They close the street just like they've done in Hollywood for their farmer's market. Get the automobiles out of here. We don't want them. We're not in a hurry either. We're, we're taking a stroll. We're looking at food. We're having all the kids. We're playing on the sidewalk. We're playing on the street. This is fun. People have rediscovered that the streets and sidewalks are more than just about circulation. They're also about commerce, recreation, relaxation. And street vending has a place in this picture. Street vendors, the woman pushing in a cart with pozole, or the tamales or something else, she's got a place. This conversation should be including her. And I think street vending can use this to maybe get some 
Uh, another change <laughs> that's happening. It's a change about the people that live in our city. Anyone know who Muhammad Bouazizi is? Yes, sir. Uh, kicked off the Muslim Egyptian. He was in, like, burned himself to death. That's right. He confiscated the scale. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, you guys heard about this. Tunisian street vendor harassed for years. One day, cops harassing him again. Take his scales away from him. He's distraught. He goes to, I guess he goes to the mayor or something in Tunisia and says, help me. They ignore him. So he sets himself on fire in protest. Dies a few days later, this part's first. Tunisia, the protest spread across the Middle East, and it leads to the Arab Spring. He was a sympathetic character. People didn't see him as unfair competition. Some people may, may have. But most people said, here's a sympathetic character trying to make a living the only way he knows how. And it became a flashback for a lot of social change in the Middle East. Um, what about Los Angeles? When I moved to Southern California 20 years ago, L.A. was a different place. Different police chief, Rodney King riots, different governor. It was a different place. Los Angeles today is much more diverse than it was, much more diverse community than it was 20 years ago. And I think the city is much more happy about its diversity today than it has ever been. This is one of my favorite murals. This is at the MTA Transit headquarters in downtown Los Angeles. That's LA. It's the world. The world is here. And I think people are, are much more accepting in Los Angeles. If I didn't come from a culture where street vending is practiced, I get it. But a lot of people did, and that should have a part, a legal part of the mosaic that makes Los Angeles the great city. Thanks for your attention. Questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Um, I've kind of challenged one of your opportunities. That I do agree that streets are much more being recognized as public places. But, however, in Los Angeles, especially on the sidewalks, there's a problem that there's a lot of kind of history of privatization of sidewalks, the line, you know, the physical line in a lot of places, and the flat that says this is private property. Mm-hmm. And so you talk about how that kind of history of privatization of sidewalks in Los Angeles kind of interact with um, you know, the idea of street vending. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Um, historically, a long time ago, construction paving and sidewalk construction was up to a property owner. All the property owners on a block would have to agree, or most of them would have to agree to do that, to, to, build, to pave the streets and build a sidewalk. Um, so it was, in a sense, their space. And you could see how they would want to defend that space. Now, the city said, you got to let people use it, took it back and forth, but it was still owned by the adjacent property owner. Now, some time ago, about 30 or 40 years ago, in Los Angeles anyway, the city assumed the responsibility of maintaining the streets and the sidewalks. And so the city's stake, the city's interest in these sidewalks is now greater than it was before. Now, whether technically the sidewalk is still owned by a private owner, whether it's been dedicated to the public, that, that, that depends. But today, the argument that it's public is stronger than it once was. Now, there are some places that look public, like plazas, where you look down and you'll see a plaque right to pass here by permission of a property owner only, subject to revocation at any time. There's Rockefeller Center, see that? Those are different. These are plazas that are never considered to be part of the, the sidewalk infrastructure of a city. They look public, but they're really private. And if we're interested in legalizing street vending, I don't think we need to address those places initially. I think we have a lot of sidewalk space and a lot of public land in the city that we could go after at least initially before we start wrestling with those places. That those spaces are targeted in New York, in New York City, as places that should be taken over in the street market. I, I don't think that they've made a lot of that. I think it's going to go follow up to that. I think a lot of those places, like um, Wilshire and Western, uh, where you, we're seeing more TOD development, where it's kind of private public partnership. Yeah. The, the problem, I mean, I, I think it's, it sets a very interesting kind of space that it's developed by a private developer. But it's as a transit, you know, as a big transit hub, there are a lot of people, so there's a great opportunity for street vending. But like, you know, with the private development, like they have actually security guards and 
can't even sit on these steps, even though there's a transit stop, right? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So I think that that's a really interesting kind of, yeah, there are issues where it is you know, not a private sidewalk, but as we're seeing where COTs come online in the mm-hmm. city, that could be opportunities, but there's also challenges with the space. Okay. That's a good point. I didn't know how strict they were at that stop. Oh, yeah. So, so the lesson that the policymaker would draw is that when we work with MTA to develop these sites, we need to make sure that we reserve venue rights that we can give on behalf of the public that we can give to venues and the public alike so that we don't stifle these spaces. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's a number of issues at work here, and especially in California, that kind of make it a little bit difficult to come up with a lot of that. In New York, um, it, there's just so much traffic, it's a, a little bit different. And here, we have, I mean, the streets are smaller there, and the, the traffic is, is different than here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it makes it difficult to come up with laws and rules that would be fair to everybody, least of all, the people that are on the street trying to earn a living. So, to me, it kind of sort of comes down to, why don't we just have designated areas where you can have street vendors to where it's fair for them as well as somewhat semi-fair for the surrounding businesses uh, and can actually service patrons or or would-be patrons, people like myself or anybody else walking by, Mm -hmm. that would want to use those services. And the other thing is, it kind of is intriguing to me that you kind of stay away from street vendors who sell goods and services that are other than food. Because food is one thing, and it opens up a whole other can of worms, i.e., safe and healthy laws, uh, health laws. Mm-hmm. That in when somebody's just selling a product, it doesn't touch on it. It's more a question of are they direct competition for the stores in the neighborhood that they're that they're you know moving into, mm-hmm. and it also opens up the other side. Are they trying to sell <coughs> goods that are copycats? Of designers or people who are, you know, using quality goods, and, you know, that whole issue. Sure. So I, I think it's I think there's more issues at work here than just the food. Because personally, I got to tell you, I don't buy from too many food vendors unless I see people who have been standing around for 10 or 15 minutes and they're either not dropping dead or running for a bed. <laughs> Seriously, you know what I'm saying? Because there's too many of them now. It used to be, you know, you feel a whole lot safer. And on the other hand, <coughs> what's happening in Santa Monica, where they've taken a street and turned it into a foot promenade, mm-hmm. there's no cars anymore on that street. Okay? But every single vendor now looks like every other vendor. I don't buy from them anymore because they're carrying the same goods that are in the stores that they're standing in front of. Mm-hmm. There's no more individuality whatsoever. So they've taken that and ruined it completely. Why they have those, I don't know. So can you kind of sort of address those things other than the food sure. side? I, I guess I need to make my list of challenges longer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to make my list of opportunities longer to balance it. Um, the, the first part of your, your comment, I think, went to space where, gee, do they really need to be able to vent all over town? New York is different than L.A. Um, I, I'd be interested in, in giving the free market a chance. The, the vendors are not going to set up in the middle of a, a residential district deep in the Hollywood Hills. Right. Because they're, they're going to get enough business just by their time. They're going to set up in MacArthur Park. They are going to set up in South Los Angeles, communities that are one densely populated, two people are accustomed to buying from vendors, three, they like the price point, four, many of those folks lack a car, so they can't, you know, get in the car and go drive somewhere to buy. So I, I'm interested in seeing how the free market would, would sort this out. And I, I suspect that the free market would well, let vendors and their customers find each other. The, the place where you get most, the most complaints about street vendors in LA are in communities where they reduce gentrification. Where you get folks who are not accustomed to that activity moving and saying, you know, I didn't pay, I didn't invest in this community to see this. Sort of thing. Um, but the other extreme you don't hear much about. It. So I think as far as the spatial restrictions, I think I would be willing to let that Failing that, let them bend in commercial zones, not in residential zones. Um, another comment you had was about the what. What are they selling? Are they, what about the goods? Are they, are they competing with, unfairly with, um, businesses selling? What happens when um, 
a clothing store is operating the mall, and a vacant space down the hall is uh, is home of a new clothing store. I got go in competition with you. That's just wrong. Well, but but ain't that the nature of capitalism? And not to channel Big Bob here. Because <laughs> not gonna vote. But uh, you know, isn't that sort of the idea? Of, this is the good part of capitalism. Isn't this sort of the idea that you know we're out there to make a buck and we're competing? Now, if the argument is, oh, but the storefront has to pay rent and the street vendor doesn't, isn't that unfair? Well, then my response is, it kind of sucks to be a street vendor, and it kind of it's inconvenient to shop from a street vendor. You're buying clothes from a street vendor. Uh, where can I try this on? You know, <laughs> it's not, it's not, a, it's not the same experience. When I walk into Saks, and it's been years, but when I walk, ooh, I kind of like this. Or Nordstrom, that's a, an example of something. You know, I feel richer just when I walk in the door. Oh, I, I am somebody. And that's not a feeling I get when I stop to pre street So I think there are different experiences. And I don't see quite the head to head competition that, that other people do. Um, the, the piracy, I get that completely. And But, you know, I've seen pirated goods inside Scorpions too. Right? Exactly. So I, 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 I don't think, I think suppressing vending do. Discourage piracy is throwing the baby out of It seems. But, uh, but I appreciate the comments. I'm going to keep, keep thinking about this. I'm going to go over here and then come back. Is there a hand up over here for this man? I have a question about the data sets we got from New York. Yes. Um, does LA collect that same similar data? I don't. I would think they do. And if so, do you think that that is a challenge in trying to legalize street vending? You know, it, it's a funny, you, you asked that because over lunch with, with my colleagues, they posed that same question to me. Yeah. And, uh, and at first I, I put food and it said, oh, it's not worth it. Because in L.A., there's only one code section on street vending. It's a lake full stop. So it's not, to me, it's not that, that interesting as far as the crystals of mud. But then I was, well, wait a minute. They're getting, um Speak up. Rosio is a is a graduate student, just about to finish her PhD in sociology. Rosio, you, you have a perspective on this. Rosio's done research on on street vendors in, in Los Angeles. Uh, I, I I've tried to do this in the past, and one of the things that I realized is that uh, I study street vendors in particular, and a few of them get cited using house code uh, violations, uh, but a few of them also get cited by the LAPD. And when I've looked at the tickets that they receive, they get cited for issues such as loitering or being a complete nuisance. And so, in, you know, it, it's very difficult to get a, you know, information from the LAPD seeking violations that have loitering because you can't distinguish whether they were given to a person who was drunk or a person who was selling on the street. And the easier way would be to go through the health department because they have very, very specific violations. But then that would only capture people who sell food on the street and not people who sell, you know, DVDs or T-shirts. Um, so it's a little trickier because there is that overarching no vending ordinance. Was the New York data set easy to use? Is it accurate? Yeah, the, there were, there were some issues with the data where the, uh, the some information was not written down in the citation or. Um, a street address was not used. Instead, it was an intersection, so you had to kind of back in for, for mapping purposes, which is a, which is another line of inquiry. Um, for purposes of this immediate inquiry on the citations, what, what was the violation? We really didn't run into that many problems. It was more like identifying where was the citation given, and we're going to do a, a spatial. We have some other questions. We're going to have to take it down. We're going to have to figure out how to deal with these these questions. That, that's a very good question. And you, you run into this any time you're using data. Yeah. How good is the data? On this, for this particular question, that is pretty good. On another question, it's pretty good. And it was like, city data from the city. That's right. It, it's a city database. Uh, fortunately, city of New York, big city, sophisticated. Um, hallelujah, it's electronic yeah. and not just boxes. Of citations. That's a good thing. I work for the city. I have no idea how the city keeps its equivalent data as far as street vending citations for violating the sidewalk or much less out there, which is like the county. No idea whether they keep it electronic or not. Yes, sir. Um, 
thank you very much for the talk. Um, I uh, met in Benit's class and actually worked on um, with Rachel here on um, mobile food vendors for our uh, quarter-long research projects. So we're looking at the Twitter trucks and the uh, taco trucks and the boutique trucks. And we're actually delivering our final presentation immediately after this. So I'm like too, totally amped now and would invite you to come <laughs> if you have time. Um, um, and so I had a question. Um, just totally tangentially, New York City also has a really great data because Bloomberg made it, I, I came here from New York and he made it a signature of his administration of data-driven policy. So he's always interested in the bottom line and measuring. So it's, it's not only every city office has tons of data you know, doing research. Like There's a lot to be called. Um, but, but my question gets to um, this idea of, I think the, the crystal and mud is, is, a, is a wonderful distinction to um, think about the structures of the laws. But... One thing that we encountered talking to um, the Twitter truck um, owners and the loncheros is this um, idea of lopsided enforcement, where um, really enforcement only happened when brick and mortar uh, establishments or neighbors would call and complain, and then an inspector would show up, or then a police officer would show up, or in one case in particular, you know, I asked that uh, it was on, in front of LACMA, and I asked them, like, oh, why are you parking LACMA? And he's like, oh, well, you know, we tried to go into Venice, there's a lot of people, but the owners, the business owners always call the cops, and the ticket maids will get multiple tickets for the same violation, whereas here in LACMA, the ticket, uh, the meter maid might come by once a day, mm-hmm. and I only get one ticket. And so, I wonder, because um, Benita sent us the paper, and so you seem to be advocating more for the, the mud laws versus the crystal laws, and, and I just wonder, with that flexibility, what happens when the enforcement arm is responding to, you know, uh, complaints rather than a more even enforcement of the law. If that makes sense, it's like yeah. so we're giving more leeway, but it's in, then it sure. becomes enforced unevenly. Yeah, I, I get it. You, you worry that the cops going to show up. They already got the complaint, so in their mind they are perhaps sympathizing with the complainer. Sure. They show up mud law and write them a citation. Sure. Um, you know, I, I guess I have two responses. The data suggests in Europe that's not happening. Mm-hmm. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Well, I think the NYPD is different. I think they are they're trying to be part of the community and trying to be, trying to basically act like they are judges of order on the street. Mm-hmm. Kind of like the old beat cop, but in, but in a positive way. You know, not, not knocking the minorities and, and other folks, but just trying to keep, okay, now what makes sense here? I think training has changed. I think the way police officers has changed. I think how our police weren't here in LA was as much as much more their diverse police. Just about maintaining order. Just because someone complains doesn't mean I'm on their side. I'm going to go and make a judgment for myself. So it, that's a narrative that I just didn't do. It's backed up by the data. I, I'm willing to give my rules a try again. Philadelphia, for what it's worth, I, I didn't quote the ordinance, but Philadelphia has a mud approach to where vendors set up on the sidewalk. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll paraphrase it. Set up reasonably so as not to interfere with ingress and egress to buildings or block the flow of pedestrian traffic on the street. Mm-hmm. Full stop. You know this 8 feet, 6 feet, 5 feet stop that they have in New York City. And supposedly, I'm going to the second end, but supposedly Philadelphia, street vending, we're cool. And the vendors sometimes fight with each other. Sure. Or with space and he's fighting them. But otherwise, I think it's my sense is that it's working in Philly. Let's try it here. You know, if it doesn't work, look, change the rules. Work to the show. I'm just going to build on that because, you know, this is this is a brilliant talk, Greg. And when we started our class, one of the first things, we already had your abstract. So one of mm-hmm. the first things we did in the class was I posed this question if you have these crystal rules or mud rules, what would you expect? Mm-hmm. And I think almost all of us in the class said we would expect that there'd be more citations on the mud rules. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, it's, it's wonderful to see this data. I was thinking about a couple of things. Um, so in, in your lessons, I think all of us would agree with lessons two and three that the crystal rules need to be better mm-hmm. and that there has to be more space for vending, otherwise you are creating it impossible. And the mud one as marked. So we're, I was thinking two things. One, if, the, if within the citations, 
you know, you, you mentioned, I think, in the paper today uh, that two-thirds of the citations, sorry, two-thirds of the, sorry, the rules are crystal and one-third yeah. are not. Yeah. But if you look at citations, three-fourths are crystal and one-fourth okay. are not. Yeah. Yes. Now, I was wondering, if, if that distribution of citations had matched the two-thirds and the one-thirds, mm -hmm. would you have dropped the claim that you're more likely to get a citation for a crystal rule? Because they're sort of matching the frequency of law. Okay, so the crystal versus mud, three-fourths of the citations are crystal, and that holds true when you, it's actually reinforced when you go to court. It's in court. And in but case, you have more crystal yeah. rules also, so you have more crystal citations. Uh, so, so there's more choice. There's, there's the more country. likelihood in so the sense. So more crystal rules, it's so you, just going to go to them. But, and, but still, you're right to point out that you are still mm -hmm. getting more rules, more citations for the mud, for the crystal rules. Yes. But there are many more crystal rules. And in yeah. some ways, doesn't a cop have discretion in enforcing it? Isn't every crystal rule really a mud rule? Because you look the other way. It, it is, it's mud in the sense that the cop doesn't have to cite your fleet. Yes. You know, I can decide, yeah, I'll let you go this way. But if the cop does choose to cite it, the cop's thinking, what's going to happen when this goes to court? If it's a crystal rule, I'm thinking it's basically going to be a scoring contest between me and the vendor. Your Honor, it was, it was closer than eight feet. The vendor's going to say, no, it wasn't. And the judge is going to go with me. I'm, I'm right at that. The mud rule, though, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say, Your Honor, the, the umbrella was dirty. And the vendor is going to say, No, it wasn't. Here's a photograph. The judge is going to be looking at the photograph. And the judge, the judge might disagree. I, I think. Which would suggest maybe mud rules are better. Yes. Well. Because you get, you can get away with it. And in the crystal rules, I think once you get the citation. Yeah. So we're just, and we're just, I think, playing off what you're suggesting mm -hmm. in terms of policy rules. The less faith, I think, compared to you have in this, that vendors will be better off in a switch from crystal to mud. So if, if all we had is, was mud, then perhaps we'd see a lot of citations. And we'd also say, no longer a crystal. That I can use, I'm stuck with my okay, I'm just concerned. Just the only thing. But I think, the, but the other part, which is sort of, you know, it's, you have to have some space to win, and these spatial rules, uh, these crystal rules tend to make. Now, is there also more or less a correlation between crystal rules and spatial rules? There's not. And, and I was surprised because I thought crystal space, you call the 8 foot 6 feet. Um, but it's not. And I was really surprised. Like the gloves well, so we do yeah. the crystal, but it's a health rule. It, exactly. Some place. of the health rules are pretty crystal-like. Some of the spatial rules are actually pretty muddy, it turns out. Um, so there is a it's not, it's not um, I So one of my presentations, uh, I'm one of the presenters also, and we were also looking kind of at street, at street vending and specifically at Paraderos. Um, and in a lot of the literature, it talks about how Los Angeles is basically the only uh, city in the nation, a uh, large city that doesn't have street vending. So can you talk a little bit about why, or your observations as to why Los Angeles has been hesitant to Why, why is that why? Um, and what makes it different, I guess, from other places like New York that also are very diverse? And yeah, I, I don't know a lot about Los Angeles history generally, but at the time the automobile came to LA in the 1920s, this was a big population boom for Los Angeles, and it was a lot of immigration from the upper Midwest to the U.S. And I'm told, and I, I haven't seen the data on this, I'm told that in the 1920s and 30s, Los Angeles was the latest city in the United States, the whitest big city in the United States. So it wasn't like New York, which was you know, very diverse from the beginning, the Philadelphia or Chicago. It was very diverse. In European immigrant heavy cities. LA was different. LA was, I think, one author calls it the city of courts, and I think for many reasons it was just that. And 
think the, I think the people that came to Ellie and populated in the 30s and we grew up with it in the 50s, you know, we don't want to be like New York. We like to work. Mm-hmm. LA was very honorable. They took pride that it wasn't corrupt like some East Coast cities were. Everything was a right angle in Los Angeles. And street pending is not about right angles. It's different. Now, LA has been transformed in the past 30 years. Since 1980, the, the face of the city has become like this. And so we're playing catch up. I think we're, we're just now realizing who we are. Wow, we changed. So it's time for us to, to embrace that. Embrace this. That's what we're doing. I was just going to submit that maybe another kind of policy opportunity that might blend the mud crystal distinction is organization, promoting organization among the members. So I actually did several years of research on street vendors in India. And they have a really interesting policy there, which is, you know, very kind of shoddily implemented or unevenly implemented across the country. But the idea behind it was, you know, every place is different and every street is different and there's just so many different dynamics at play that the best solution is to sort of leave it to the free market, essentially, with the understanding that vendors will organize and keep each other accountable, sort of in their collective best interests in a way that, you know, keeps the sidewalks passable for pedestrians, keeps it clean. And so I did a bunch of case studies, and I saw that, I mean, really it was true that where the vendors were organized, they, you know, there were food zones, for example, where the vendors were, like, had an organization, got themselves trained in proper food preparation, and kept themselves accountable because they wanted to promote that space collectively as, like, a a safe food zone. Um, You know, and in other places where the vendors are less organized, um, there's more likely to be this conflict with the police or with the businesses or the residents of that place. Mm -hmm. And so... um, you know, that to the extent that the city can promote kind of like self-regulation, I think it makes the point of mud versus crystal somewhat more. Mm-hmm. That, that's a, an excellent observation. Um, I, I'm told that the, the taco trucks, have, have, they've organized an association. And as a result, they are playing by the rules. I mean, the message is, look for this organization, we all need to play by the rules. Pay your taxes, or pay the traffic rules, because if you screw up, it makes a bad thing for all of us. And so that's actually near to the benefit of people who didn't like the top cars. There's a lot more work in the street. There, there was a. Someone else had a word. No, you, you, you get, there, no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> you get the hook. Yeah. <laughs> we do have our final presentation, so if you are free, or if anyone else wants to join us in 5273 from I think, 2 to 5. So please do, but thank you so much.